We've heard uh, in quite a good detail about the 200, 800 pound gorillas that are staring us in the face. The first one, of course, is global warming. We're seeing the second one, uh, the subject of our conference. And both are being played out before us as our society sleepwalks towards the future. This is climate change, of course, and this is peak oil. <laughs> and this is our official response. <laughs> Dick Lawrence asked me to speak about potential for renewables as well as the barriers, and I think this is probably one of the largest barriers facing us. It's also one of the barriers that Jim Gordon faces as the entrenched business as usual folks try and frustrate any new ideas. Global warming and peak oil are creating the perfect storm for renewable energy, as far as I can see. Now, the resource inventory for solar. Every minute of solar income is sufficient to power the entire world for a full year. Ten weeks of incident solar energy is roughly equivalent to the energy of all known reserves of fossil fuels. More than 10,000 homes in the U.S. are already powered by solar energy. And if the roof area of the shopping malls in the U.S. were simply covered with solar panels, we could power every home in our country. The solar potential is substantial. It's a resource that's reasonably well distributed. And you can see in the upper graph the growth in the marketplace in recent years, especially in Europe and Japan. As the cost of solar modules has come down, the volume has gone up dramatically, and this is what the financial folks call the hockey stick in the curve. This is projected growth. Both wind and solar are now seeing compounded annual growth rates of between 40 and 45 percent annual. The resource inventory for wind, Jim Gordon spoke about offshore wind. The wind resource is available in the heartland with just three rural states, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Texas, or North Dakota, Kansas, and Texas, can generate enough electricity to meet the needs of our entire country. The total amount of electricity that could be generated from U.S. wind resources is estimated at well over 10 billion kilowatt hours annually, and that is three times the present electrical generation in U.S. This past August, the U.S. wind production surpassed 10 megawatts, which is 10 large nuclear or coal plants that didn't have to be built. I'm sorry. Yes, gigawatts. Thank you. This is a wind resource map. Jim Gordon is talking about this area here, which is in the very dark band, showing excellent wind resources. We see wind resources reasonably well distributed, and we're talking about just simply harvesting these wind resources, which are in the middle range, to be able to power our entire country. The cost of wind power has dropped dramatically in the last two decades to the point where it's within reach of being cost competitive with our lowest cost but dirtiest source of electricity, that's coal, of course. And that's even before you consider the externalities. Dick Lawrence is uh, keen on bringing us all focused on the energy return on energy invested. As far as solar cells are concerned, depending on which technology you use and where you field it, you have between a three and a four year return on energy investment. And then, of course, uh, you have 20, 22, 25 years of essentially free energy. Solar cells are solid state devices. They need minimal, if any, maintenance. And just quickly, uh, here's how solar stands up 
8 to 1 or 12 to 1 energy out versus energy in. Wind is 5 to 1 or 20 to 1, and of course, this is largely dependent a lot on where you field these systems. And then quickly, you can look at how it stacks up with other options. I began my career working for the oil companies on the Alaskan Pipeline Project in the early 70s. A minor geopolitical event occurred. It was the 1973 Middle Eastern War, which of course precipitated the first world oil embargo. To make a long story short, I resigned my position on the pipeline and came back to Boston with a little bit of money and a lot of enthusiasm, recognizing that the best use of my budding talents was not going to the end of the earth to extract the last drop of fossil fuel, but rather to found a design firm to design energy autonomous buildings and the engineering of the energy systems to power them. That was in the early 70s, and solar homes looked like this. Uh, perhaps functional, but not necessarily uh, mainstream. <laughs> We were privileged to receive the commission from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's solar R&D program in 1979 to design the first well and truly energy autonomous all solar home, which was built in the central Massachusetts town of Carlisle. Rooftop photovoltaics, roof integrated solar thermal, lots of south glass, modest amounts of glass on the east, west, and north, an operable clear story for passive solar cooling, super insulation, internal thermal mass, monolithic air and moisture barriers, air-to-air -air heat exchangers with heat recovery ventilation, a dual compressor high-efficiency heat pump for supplemental on-demand heating, cooling, dehumidification with the hot de superheater off the hot side of the compressor, backup domestic hot water. Bottom line, this is no fossil fuel on site, and the house exports a surplus of energy to the utility grid. And so as objectively as I can be, I'd like to suggest that what exists must be possible and to point out that we did this over 25 years ago. We are now routinely doing energy autonomous homes in pretty much every geographic zone and climate region of the country. This is a house we did on the main coast in northern New England that every year since it was finished in 1994 has produced a surplus of electricity. If you care to visit this house, the Lord's, the owners have their own website, they're quite proud of solar living and have all the statistics at solarhouse.com. A house we did in the hot, humid climate in North Carolina, a larger photovoltaic array powering a geothermal heat pump, electricity, heating and hot water, cooling, no fossil fuels. A project we're currently working on in north central New England, a solar electric roof on a traditional New England farmstead. The house is in the background. You see the solar thermal system. This house is completely powered by renewable energy from on-site generation. There's enough headroom in the solar electric system to power an electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid. And it's in northern New England with fairly challenging winter climate and modest amounts of sunlight. Again, I would suggest that what exists must be possible. We're routinely doing these homes. We also do existing homes. We were fortunate to have the opportunity to do the world's first solar-powered neighborhood where we converted an entire community of post-World War II ranch homes to solar power. While we were in town, we even did the Burger King. We had things our way. We were privileged to be retained by BP to help them with their solar-powered gas station deployment. The existing flat panel canopies got these low-angle retrofits, and the new builds got these more dramatic barrel-vaulted canopies, which are glazed with a transparent thin film photovoltaic element that produces electricity while allowing light to come through. We got BP to add electric vehicle recharge ports at the solar-powered gas stations. How's that for beyond petroleum? Solar electricity as a building skin, a project we recently completed for Tiger Woods in Southern California where the curtain wall itself is a solar power plant. The Ballard Library in Seattle, photovoltaics in the skin to attenuate the solar gain, a giant solar cube, 
in Southern California, where the south surface is one of the largest thin film solar arrays in the U.S. I'm going to go up in scale, larger and larger. This is the Environmental Studies Center at Oberlin College. We were privileged to help Dr. David Orr create what I believe is the first academic facility that's completely powered by solar energy with a verifiable surplus. We have rooftop solar. We also have a solar pavilion taking advantage of an underutilized piece of campus real estate, that is the surface parking lot where the sun was previously just overheating the faculty's cars. We're now harvesting that sunlight to power two academic facilities on campus completely with a verifiable surplus of solar and no fossil fuels. The first residential high-rise tower in New York City with photovoltaics in the building skin. They have a custom glass solar canopy, an electric canopy at the entryway, and solar electricity in the spandrel and non-vision area. Another project on the east side of New York City on Roosevelt Island where we covered the roofs with solar. Georgetown University's Intercultural Center, when it was completed in 1985, we had fielded the largest rooftop system in the world and the first commercial application of solar electricity as the building skin. Genzyme's corporate headquarters in Cambridge and a project that we're especially proud of the U.S. mission to the United Nations, where before it looked like a parking garage with windows, we were asked to create a solar skin for the structure, and that's the after. We were privileged to support the Olympic Village design team in 1996 to make the Summer Games in Atlanta the first solar-powered Olympics. And this is sort of the mother load of rooftop harvest a 1.25 megawatt rooftop system in New Jersey. This is a half a megawatt power converter that's about the size of a FedEx van and weighs 12,000 pounds. And there are hundreds and hundreds of square kilometers of sun-baked roof real estate begging to be harvested every day. And in fact, entrepreneurial visionaries like Jim Gordon have looked into the future and developed a business plan to change the world, in this case by looking for eligible roof real estate that is presently going underutilized and making a business proposition. Did you know your roof was not being effectively used? Well, how's that? Well, there's sun on it, yeah. You could harvest that sun. It's going to waste, really. Well, we'd like to suggest that we'll put our capital in to harvest your sun, and if you want, we'll sell you the electricity for less than you're paying for it now. And if you're not up for that, then we can sell it to someone else. But your roof's doing you no good right now except keeping the rain out. A project here in Boston, which is powered by both solar energy and wind, we fielded what the press called the first urban turbine right on the I-93 corridor going outside the city, across from the painted gas tank there. And we're privileged to have worked with Jim Gordon on the utility scale turbine at the Massachusetts Maritime Academy's campus at the western mouth of the Cape Cod Canal, which produces approximately a third of the 18 building campus electrical load on an annual basis. And here's the real attractive benefit. It has a direct cash on cash payback of less than six years. And that's without any grants, without any incentives, without any tax credits, it's just simply displaced electricity purchases. And that's because they happen to have a very good wind resource. Now, wind resources are of a nature that you have to use them where they occur. The folks that were here a little while ago perhaps don't understand that. Uh, in fact, a lot of people don't quite get it. Uh, our coast, as Jim Gordon has mentioned, all along the eastern seaboard is wonderfully endowed with wind resources. And this is where the Cape Wind Farm will be built. We are eagerly looking forward to a transition in leadership here at the Massachusetts gubernatorial level. And uh, are hoping that we have a visionary leadership uh, that will bring these new technologies forward. Again, you have to use the wind resources where they occur. You don't have the option of putting the wind farm 
in the disadvantaged, uh, you know, poorer neighborhood, perhaps, as you do with the heavy residual oil plant or the coal plant. We do have a choice. The folks that have been objecting to wind are not willing to give up electricity. And so what we end up is we end up with more of these. Uh, it's not a question of if we don't build wind, we don't build anything. It's a question of if we don't build wind, then we're going to build more of these. And of course, everyone in this room knows what that entails. So I'd like uh, everyone in Massachusetts and everyone surrounding Massachusetts to support the Cape Wind Project because this is the first one and it's turning the corner toward a hopeful view of our energy future. Dick Lawrence asked for barriers. This is probably one of the biggest barriers that faces all of us. And this is conventional uh, economic wisdom uh, perpetuated by folks who have a very limited uh, vision. Basically, that resources will continue uh, to be abundantly available if the market just wants them to be. And if you look at this part of the photograph, you might agree. But if you look at the whole construct, you see that, well, wait a minute now. There's got to be some limitation within this. Yeah, well, if you go to Europe, you'll see kilometer after kilometer after kilometer of large-scale photovoltaic deployments along the Autobahns in Austria, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Germany. Why? Well, because it's there. First off, land is one of our most precious resources, and we're certainly not getting the most value out of it. We're building a lot of sound barriers. I don't know what the cost effectiveness is, but they make an ideal platform to field large deployments of solar electricity in or near the urban core. A secondary lightweight support structure, you can build these in modular chunks, megawatts and megawatts of solar right in or near the urban core, no new land taking, guaranteed solar access, nothing will be built here. The utility frequently crosses the highway, you just plug in. And how about the railway rights of way? Well, first of all, Europe has a railroad. It's all electric. And there's a perfect symbiosis. You just plug in. It's three meters away. In the US, of course, we have an underutilized resource, parking lots. It's a project we did in Tennessee, 12 acres of pavement surrounding a stadium. And we harvest some of that sunlight that actually just creates an urban heat island. This is in Phoenix covered parking. This is in LA. And the Grand Dame is in Sacramento at the Cal Expo Fairgrounds. Again, black asphalt, underutilized, urban heat island. We harvest that sunlight. And even the folks in the big SUVs are not complaining because their cars are in the shade. This is a way to demonstrate multiple benefits from a single strategy that, of course, helps in every way. You do see large ground-mounted solar power plants. This is in Germany. But we don't have to do this. And I don't really advocate this because I think we're paving over way too much of our arable land already. And we're continuing to expand the population exponentially. We're going to have a really serious food issue from my perspective. Uh, but let's let that aside and just simply say, that if you do this, you have to spend a lot of money on foundations and support structure, whereas if you put it on the building, the building is the support structure. And so it's much less expensive to use rooftops. You also have a direct load right beneath the system. Dick Lawrence asked that we all address the blueprint for the ASPO energy strategies. And I'd give this an A+. Plus. And I think everyone should review it and also put it into practice. I think everyone would agree that efficiency and conservation are the foundations for success. But how are we going to pay for this transition? There's questions about, well, is it cost effective and can we afford it and is it convenient and where are the resources coming from? Jim Gordon politely addressed this a moment ago. We need to build a bridge to the post-petroleum world. Our present energy policy is the Thelmer and Louise transition. <laughs> Where's the money going to come from? We have the money as a society.
We just have to decide how we're going to use our resources. So what's plan B? And plan B, of course, is to begin in earnest investing our resources to build a sustainable society. And the choices that we make, how we prioritize our expenditures of energy and resources today will certainly determine what kind of world we leave behind for those that follow. This is the 2005 military budget, at least that's what they'll admit to. Those who are close to the issue say it's really up here somewhere. This is everything else. I call this the U.S. military budget. This is us. <laughs> this is our money. We need to tie a knot in this and we need to begin investing our resources in earnest to build a sustainable society. If we are not willing to do that as a society, then all the rest of this discussion is just nibbling around the edges, I'm sorry to say. And that's my own personal opinion. I'm not speaking for ASPO. What kind of future do we want? It's time for us to choose. And renewable energy is ready. It's off the shelf. It's available. It's proven. It's reliable. It has a 25-year warranty. All we need is the political will to use these tools. Thank you very much.